Okay. So hi everyone. This is going to be exam prep week 12 and we're going to be covering sorting. And as a preface, all these sorting algorithms, I think are really, really fun to learn. Sorting algorithms, I don't know, it's a pretty cool part of this class. It's a bit different than the data structure section, but it's really, really fun as well. Okay, so I have a bit of notes prepared. So we're gonna be talking about comparison sorts. And what is a comparison sort? It's a sort that uses like compare operations in the sort algorithm itself. And you guys will be learning about sorts later in the class. They don't actually use like compare to, they use other ways of sorting them. Okay, so for each sort, we should first like think about what's valuable to keep in mind when we look at a sorting algorithm, okay? So there's three things that I've highlighted that are important to consider when we look at a sorting algorithm. The first one is how the sorting algorithm is implemented, okay? The second thing is the best case and worst case runtimes of the sorting algorithm and why that's the case, okay? And the third thing that we should consider is why would we ever use the sorting algorithm to begin with, okay? So for each sorting algorithm, these are the three things that I think are important to keep in mind. Okay, so with that in mind, the first one, it's on the easier side, it's called selection sort. All we do is we find the minimum element and then we move it to the front. Then we find the minimum out of all that are remaining. So in this case, the minimum is one, we move one here. Then we find the minimum, which is two and we move two to the front and then we repeat until the whole array is sorted, okay? So you guys have probably seen like some variation of this before. I think it's an intuitive way to approach sorting a list. So let's quickly talk about the best case and worst case runtimes. Does anyone have any ideas for best case and worst case? Okay. Okay. So, okay, I'll just give the answers. So let's like try to figure out what the sorting algorithm is doing and how much work we're actually executing, okay? So we see here what happens is the first pass we're doing n work, right? Because we look at n elements and we find the minimum. The second pass we do n minus one work because there's n minus, n, n minus one elements remaining and we find the minimum there. So you guys can kind of see that the total amount of work that we're doing is the sum of n plus n minus one plus n minus two plus all the way to one, right? That's the total amount of work we're doing. And what is the sum? Well, this should be ingrained in our heads as n squared. So we see here the best and worst case runtime of selection, short, of selection sort is n squared. Okay, and how insertion sort works is we are going to grow our sorted array from this right-hand side, okay? All we're gonna be doing is we keep looking, we're gonna first look at seven and we're gonna keep moving seven to the left until it's in its happy place, okay? Then what is left is since there's only seven here, it just stays as is. Then we see one and we move one to the left, okay? So then one moves to the front like so, okay? And then nine, this stays where it is. And then four swaps three places to get over here. Okay, so all insertion sort is really doing, it iterates through each element of the array and it moves that element. It just keeps swapping the element to the left until it's in its correct place relative to all the elements that are already there. Okay, so I like to think about insertion sort as we're growing a sorted array from this left-hand side, right? And each element that we see, right? If we see three, what's gonna happen is we'll swap three and nine, right? I'll quickly show you guys. Give me a sec. So we'll swap three and nine, then we'll swap three and seven, and then we'll swap three and four, right? Now we can see that this is our partially sorted array and we can just keep iterating like this. Okay, so there's a question about using a heap. I'll talk about like heap sort later, but yeah, heap sort is like a different algorithm entirely. Yeah, okay. So let's quickly talk about the best case and worst case runtime. Okay, just for the sake of time, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so the best case runtime is going to be theta of n and the worst case will be theta of n squared. Okay, and a quick justification why. 
suppose the array is already in sorted order, right? What happens here is every time we are at a given element, there's no swapping that needs to be done, okay? So the best case runtime arises when the given array is in sorted order and there's no swapping that needs to be done. And all we need to do is iterate through each of the n elements. The worst case runtime is if it's sorted in reverse order, right? In which case each element must do the maximum amount of work possible and keep swapping itself till it gets to the very front, okay? And that gives us n squared because we see the classic sum of one plus two plus three plus four all the way up till n. Okay, and then why would we ever use insertion sort? Well, it's very fast on small inputs and it's also fast if the array is nearly sorted. Okay, so two reasons to use insertion sort. And then the understanding question is, this one's a bit trickier. The runtime of insertion sort can be written as theta of n plus k, where k is the number of inversions. So what is an inversion? An inversion happens when we have a given pair of elements and like right here, we can see that the pair seven three exists in this array and it's an inversion because seven is earlier than three in the array, but seven is greater than three, okay? So an inversion occurs when we have a pair of elements that relative to each other are incorrect, okay? So seven three is an inversion, just to reiterate, because in this array that we're starting with, seven is to the left of three, okay? On the other hand, if we look at, I don't know, one and two, that's not an inversion because they're ordered correctly relative to each other. Okay, so why can the runtime of insertion sort be written as theta of n plus k? I'll give you guys like 30 seconds to think about it. Okay, so a lot of people are on the right track. Yes, the answer is that the number of inversions, as Anne said, is equal to the number of swapping operations that we need to do. Okay, I'll give you guys some justification why. So let's look at this example right here. Okay, we see here, I'm gonna just recopy this array. One, seven, nine, four, Actually, let's move four, okay? And let's look at three. Let's look at how many swaps would we need in order for three to go in its correct spot, right? The total number of swaps that three needs to do is the total number of inversions where three is the right element in that pair, right? The total number of swaps that three needs to do, okay, this thing is not correctly sorted. Let me fix that, my bad. Okay, we see here that there's two inversions, seven, nine, or seven, my bad, seven, three, and nine, three, that involve the element three as the right element in that pair, right? So since there's two inversions, right, these are the two inversions, we see here that three does two swaps, okay? So we can say the total number of swaps a given element does is the total number of inversions it's part of as the right element in that pair. Okay, so that's another way of characterizing insertion sort. Okay, so I'll open the floor, the floor to questions because I kind of covered a lot there. Any questions? Wait, so the n plus k, that's the average runtime, right? No, that's the exact runtime. Oh, okay. Yeah. The reason is because we do n work to like look at everything. I mean, there's always like little coefficients here and there, but the runtime is like boiled down to n plus k because we look n time to look at each element, k time to do the swapping. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, another question. So before you swap the threes, 
Um, because in the original spot, three was also less than two at the end of the list. So wouldn't that also be counted as an inversion? Okay, so right here, this is another inversion, right? Completely correct, but the reason that this inversion isn't counted and the number of swaps that three needs to do is because in this inversion, three is the left element in the pair. Okay. So the this inversion gets counted when we actually do the swapping for two, right? Does that kind of make sense? Like we don't want to double count it. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good question. So, oh, it's because I'm bad at math. Yes. Four and three should have swapped. I just completely missed that three is actually less than four. <laughs> okay. That's embarrassing. But yeah, good question. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Nice. Okay, let's keep going. Someone so, asked, um, oh. what's the difference between inversion and swaps? Oh, I missed this. Good question. So a swap, like by definition, it's just like when we swap two elements in an array. An inversion is when a pair of elements in a given array uh, like have the property where the one on the left is greater than the one on the right. That's an inversion. So in insertion sort, an inversion leads us to do a sort, but they're definitely not like the same thing. We can think about it as for every inversion we have, it's an extra swap that needs to be done. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully, maybe. Okay, worst case is like, I'll stay back for a bit. Okay, the next one is heap sort. So this one is really, really cool. Okay, so what we're gonna first do is we're gonna create a heap, and then what we're gonna do is keep removing from the heap until the array becomes sorted. That's how heap sort works, okay? So pay attention, I think this is pretty exciting. So what we're gonna do is create a max heap. Why are we creating a max heap when we go into admin heaps in this class? Well, it's because it lends itself very well to actually implementing heap sort, okay? So just trust me, I'll explain why a max heap is needed. The first thing that we want to do is take the given array and make it into a max heap, okay? How we're going to do that is we're going to bubble down every single element, okay? Okay, I'll answer that question about inversions after this spiel. So we see here that in order to get the max heap version of this array, we're gonna call do this process called bottom up heapification. How that works is we bubble down everything, okay? So we're gonna start at two. Two doesn't need to bubble down, right? Since it's already at the bottom. Six doesn't need to bubble down. Five doesn't need to bubble down. Three doesn't need to bubble down. Four, right, doesn't need to bubble down because it's already greater than two and we're creating a max heap. Then what we do is we go to nine. Does nine need to bubble down? No, it doesn't since it's already greater. One. Does one need to bubble down? Yes, it does, right? More precisely, we're gonna swap one and four. Let me see if I can get the same color. Okay, that's fine. So we'll put four up here and then one down here and then we'll go like that, right? And then what's gonna happen next is that we will bubble down seven, right? So, and it's just the simple heap operations that you guys hopefully are familiar with. Okay, and now we can see that what we're left with is nine, four, seven, two, three, five, six, one, which is this array, right, as a max heap. Okay, so now that we have this max heap, the next step is we're going to keep re repeating this. We're going to keep removing the max, and we're going to put the max at the end of the array. Then what we're going to do is take the element that was like at the end move it to the beginning and bubble it down. Okay, so let me walk through that process. Okay, so if we have this, the first thing that we do is we remove the minimum. We remove nine, and what we're gonna do is put nine at the very end. The next thing that we do in any type of heap deletion is we promote the last element to the top temporarily. Then we have to bubble this down, so we'll move it down here, okay? The cool property of a max heap is that, notice now the size of the heap has shrunk by one, 
right? This is really, really cool. And this is why we need a max seed. Okay. Now what we can see is that this is our new state of the heap, right? Since the size of the heap shrunk by one, we have a new open spot at the right hand side of the array, right? So we see we have this opening right, right here, which is where nine goes. And we could see if we continue this process of removing the minimum and putting it at the right hand side, what we're going to do is slowly grow a sorted array from the right hand side. Okay, if we keep this process of removing the current maximum or the current thing at the top of the heap, then we put it in its correct spot at the right hand side and we just keep reiterating. And we all do this in one array. That's the beauty of heap sort. You don't have to create a new array at any point in this process. When we do bottom, bottom up heapification, we're doing it on the same array. When we do this sort of like max heap deletion process, it's also on the same array. Okay. So does anyone have any questions about this? Okay. So let's keep going. Okay, I kind of spoiled the best case and the worst case here. So the best case runtime is kind of weird. It's technically theta n if we have a ton of duplicates, okay? But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. We should break down finding this runtime into two parts, okay? The first one is bottom up heapification. That's gonna take some time. And then we will call like the heap deletion process. Okay, these are the two components that add to a total runtime because we can break heap sort into these two parts. So bottom up heapification, this is like kind of surprising, but it takes theta of n time. Okay, and the proof of why it takes theta of n is a bit beyond the scope of this class, but intuitively, we notice that when we do bottom up, bottom up heapification, half the things are already where they should be, right? Everything on the bottom layer of the heap is already where it should be. So it's pretty efficient process. And then heap deletions will take around n log n time, okay? Except there is this edge case. If everything in the heap is a duplicate, then it actually takes n time in the best case, okay? So yeah, quick questions. Okay, so the reason why we use this, it has a good worst case bound. Having an n log n worst case is pretty good. And then if we already have a heap, it's really easy to do heap sort. Okay, so the question is, if we have a magical max heap that has constant time for bubble down, how would the worst case runtime change? Let's make this worst case. Anyone have any ideas? And also like feel free to voice questions about heap sort in the chat or out loud. Okay, yes. Yes, so it will be n now. The reason it's going to be n is if we look at the runtime here, the reason it's n log n is because we do n bubble down operations and each operation takes us log n time, right? If we have n operations, each taking log n time, right? And the log n is because that's the runtime of bubble down. We see here that if the runtime of bubble down becomes constant time, now our heap sort process will have n time for bottom up heapification and then n time for the heap deletions. And then it'll be n. Okay. So it'll be n worst case. Okay. Any questions on heap sort before we move on? Okay, so I'm gonna go a bit faster just for the sake of time. In merge sort, how it works is we have some given array and then what we do is each pass, we compare elements together. We compare one and seven, seven to one, and we kind of sort them relative to each other, okay? So we see here, if you guys just kind of like look at this image, we can see that 
all the elements kind of start off as like just singletons. Then we have a bunch of pairs that are sorted relative to each other. And then we have like a four element pair and then you finally get the final answer. Okay. And then the way you guys are probably like seeing merge sort is you call like you break the array in half, you call merge sort on the left, you call merge sort on the right, and then you merge both of the halves together. That's like the classic recursive solution. Okay. So does anyone want to talk about the best case and worst case runtime? Anyone want to like shout it out out loud or in the chat? Yeah, n log n. So n log n is going to be the runtime for both the best case and worst case. And for the sake of time, I can cover it after the discussion. But and then the reason why we want to use it is it's discussion question, so I'm going to save it. <laughs> okay. So okay, let's quickly dive into quicksort and then we'll go into the discussion. So there's two implementations of quicksort that you guys have learned in this class. The first one is this version called three scan. How three scan works is we look at this given array, okay? And we're gonna choose a pivot. Let's just say like the pivot is the first element for the sake of simplicity. Then what we're gonna do is break up the array into three chunks. All of the elements that are less than the pivot equal to and greater than, okay? And with that, we have these three groups. Then what we do is we call quick sort on the elements that are smaller and the elements that are bigger and then we kind of merge all of them together. So that's the intuition on how three sort works. What you guys can notice is that we may have to create new arrays. It's a bit complicated of a process, but intuitively, I think hopefully it makes sense. Okay, so there is a cooler way called whore partitioning. Okay, so I think for the sake of this discussion, I'm not gonna like dive into whore partitioning. I wanna like tackle these discussion worksheet problems. But the gist of how it works is we have two pointers, L and G, okay? And they start, L starts on the left-hand side, G starts on the right. What we're gonna do is we're gonna move the pointers to each other, okay? And we're gonna keep moving the L pointer to the right until it hits an element that it doesn't like, okay? The L pointer only likes small items or items smaller than the given pivot, so if it sees an element that's equal to it or an element that's greater than it, it'll stop there, okay? So we'll, I'll quickly walk through like one iteration. So we see here that L is pointing to four. Four is less than the pivot seven. So that's totally fine. Then L goes to nine and L says, hey, I don't like the number nine. So it stops. Then G stops at two because G doesn't like small things. And then what we do is we swap two and nine, okay? And after swapping, we're also gonna move L and G both to the right, okay? So then L keeps going and L says, I like all of these small elements, right? And then we see here that what happened is that L has overshot, right? So now what we're gonna do is after the pointers cross, we're gonna swap G and the pivot, okay? So we swap six and seven and we see here that all we did is partition around seven, which is a pretty cool thing. Okay, so that's a quick gist on whore partitioning and quicksort in general. Does anyone have any questions on quicksort, whore partitioning, or any of the stuff that I talked about? Okay, so, okay, the very, very last thing is the best case and the worst case. Let's quickly talk about that. So let's look at the best case is probably when our pivots are really, really good, right? The best case is when the pivot probably slices the array in halves, okay? Oh, question. Will the pivot for whore partitioning always be the leftmost item in the array? So. That's how we usually learned it in class is that we take the leftmost item and it makes the algorithm simpler to understand. So usually yes, but we can change it up if we ever want to. But yeah, by convention, it's the leftmost. Okay, so let's quickly talk about the best case. 
the best case happens when the pivot is always in the middle. Okay, and because of that, what you'll notice is that the runtime is going to look a lot like merge sorts runtime, and it'll become n log n. And this is if the pivot is in middle on average, right? Okay, so the next question is like the worst case is when the pivot is really, really bad, and there's basically no partitioning being done. In that case, it'll take n squared, and we'll see it's because we have the sum of n work plus n minus one work all the way till one work. Okay, and this is like a bit rash of an explanation. So stay back and I can give a better one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, time is completely correct. Okay, so any questions on quicksort and its runtime? 